Good morning, everyone. Day two of sessions at uh, 2023 PSU Mechamins. Thank you so much for uh, again joining me this morning. This is actually my second talk um, this year. So I am definitely a seasoned pro at this, um, without a doubt, right? Um, my name is John Crane. I'm a CPE at Unity uh, Technologies, and I currently work remotely out of Central Michigan. I don't think I mentioned that yesterday, um, but I yeah, am in, up in Michigan. Drove down for the conference. This is my first time here as well. And somehow I, I, they wrote me into doing two sessions. Um, I think they're like, he's new. He doesn't understand all the effort and things that you put into these things. So I was like, sure, I've done this talk before. I can, you know, add a few more things. Well, that takes a while. So did anyone actually listen to my talk? I gave at Mac DevOps, it was during COVID, so it was remote. Um, I gave a quick talk actually on GitHub Actions. Did anyone happen to see that or was there? Yes, thank you. A couple, Elliot, awesome. Um, well, I like crammed essentially this whole thing into seven minutes, I think it was. Um, and so I had to talk pretty fast to get through it, right? We have 60 minutes of content essentially today, all into seven minutes. Um, and so that definitely does not mean that I've done this before. So this is essentially a new presentation. I had to start essentially from ground zero, right? So. Um, I hope you enjoy it. Thanks again. I know there's some other great sessions. It's so cool with these rooms. I, like, I can see what Joe's presenting over there. It's pretty nice. I can just kind of follow him. Uh, so yeah, so I think we both kind of come in here with uh, maybe some potential assumptions about each other. You assume that I know something about GitHub Actions, hopefully. Um, uh, but I also know that a lot of you, even from talking um, with people uh, this week already, a lot of you use this and um, use it extensively. And hopefully whether you're starting out, you may not use GitHub at all. That's okay. I think this uh, could be helpful for you. We're not gonna go real deep into Git. I think that's one of the assumptions that I'm hoping I can make is that you're familiar a little bit, at least with GitHub. Um, so I'm just gonna say, we're not gonna start like at ground zero and go through every little thing, right? And some of you are like, great, I, I appreciate that. Um, if that's not you though, hopefully you can um, follow along, see maybe what could be done and then give you kind of an incentive to do that. So I understand if some parts are a little bit uh, like draw the rest of the owl to you. Um, if you understand that, um, yeah, you can look it up. Cool. Um, so I essentially got dropped off here at summer camp. Uh, like I said, we drove down. My kids and wife went on to DC. But this is a photo of my kids. Um, and this photo is a few, uh, from a few years back, probably five years ago or so. But it reminds me of something uh, my youngest son used to say. So we'd jump in the car and head to the library or something. And he'd, al he'd always be like, is this the way to wherever we were going? Because oftentimes, we'd not necessarily take the same exact route. Can anybody, uh, yeah. Anybody like that, you want to kind of take the scenic route every once in a while, or you have another errand to run or something. So we'd always kind of respond with, well, it's a way um, to the library or wherever. So while we're talking about GitHub Actions uh, today, please remember that this is only a way of doing it, right? Um, there's always many routes uh, from your house to the library, so many routes from uh, taking your code and doing something with it, right? So a quick overview of where we're going today. I've lost my speaker notes, but that's okay. Let's go back. Uh, we're going to take a look at what GitHub Actions are, some of the terminology and options that we can use as building blocks, and then look at some practical examples of some workflows that could help with Mac OS administration in particular, right? 
Can I scroll through this photo again? Sorry. Awesome. So what kind of comes to mind, or what do you hear, what do you, what do you feel when you hear this term, right? Now, a lot of people, and myself included, are like, it's kind of fuzzy, right? It's maybe, maybe a little bit like this. Um, this is what you're thinking was, is today's gonna be like, potentially. Or maybe you sit in front of some code and you're like, I don't, I don't know. So if you find yourself there, like, no worries. Like, this is me. All good. Um, you got me now? Awesome. I think this one's quieter though, huh? It's okay. Awesome. Um, yeah, it showed full for a minute and then it went dead. So it's okay. Um, but this is one of my favorite gifts though, so at least you had that to watch. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, after this talk, essentially, I just want to change those thoughts. If, whatever you have, um, maybe you are already confident, but um, if you're not, um, we want to move you to a place of this to this, right? <laughs> All right, so let's start breaking down this complexity. Um, and like I said, hopefully you have some knowledge of, of Git and GitHub, um, but if not, you can just do what I do and memorize a few shell commands, type them to sync it up, and then uh, if you get errors, just save it elsewhere, delete, and download a new one. So um, I'm going to preface the entire talk by stating that names and terminology are important for us to understand. So we are kind of going to go through that, so we have that baseline. And I'm going to state the soon-to-be-obvious fact that this name of GitHub Actions is confusing. It's not a great name. I think something perhaps maybe better would be GitHub Workflows, so we'll talk about that kind of throughout the presentation. Um, if that doesn't make sense right now, like later on, it will, it will. Okay, what are GitHub Actions? So let's just throw out that first term, CICD. Like, forget that I even said it. We're not gonna focus on that at all. Because um, that is kind of less useful for a Mac admin maybe, at least to think about it. So just think that GitHub Actions is a way, right, to automate stuff, all right? So we're talking about automation a little bit, um, and it's helpful for, us, helpful for us to understand that automation does not have kind of a singular purpose of just saving time, because we want it to be something like this, okay, where we have a ton of free time after we automate, but if you look at the graphs of like how much time it actually saves you over like five years, there's another XKCD on this actually, but I, th I thought adding another one would be too much. Um, it's not a ton, okay? What it does help with though is consistency, right? Repeatability and saving us from boredom, which is really the, the most important thing, right? <laughs> from boring, repetitive tasks. I'd much rather work on like some automation scripts than just doing the same task over and over. So you can automate a lot of stuff. However, um, let's all be reminded of the wisdom of Dr. Ian Malcolm, who said, your scientists were so preoccupied with whether they could they didn't stop to think if they should. Okay, so just because we can automate something in GitHub Actions definitely mean, doesn't mean we should do that, right? So there, there could be other ways of doing it. Um, and here's one reason you may not want to, okay? This happens, unfortunately, more often than I would prefer. This was kind of a major incident with GitHub, but, um, from using them over the past few years, actions does kind of tend to go down every once in a while. Um, and not to put down GitHub in, in any way, they're, they're great uh, to work with. Um, but it does happen. So 
If there's things you want to automate that are maybe more mission critical to what you're doing, um, perhaps look at something like uh, webhooks through Lambda or Cloud Functions or, or potentially even running locally. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but before we go much further and get excited about actions, um, let's take another reality check of something you might have thought about as well and look at um, costs. Okay, so here are the private repo costs for running actions on different OSs. Okay, you can see Mac OS down here at the bottom. And I think this is really awesome that you can even do it, right? Um, it's awesome that they have Mac OS runners available and you can run it for a minute or you can run it for five minutes or an hour. And again, the not so awesome thing is what we see here. They cost eight times that of a Linux server. So for long running actions, like something like this, it's running eh, maybe 50 minutes each run, gets a little confusing, right? Uh, but thankfully, um, that math is only needed for private repos. If you didn't catch that, um, any GitHub action on a public repo is like totally free. And if you have private repos that you're running, you can use self-hosted, so kind of bring your own hardware, install some software on it, um, set it up as a runner. You can do that for free as well. Um, but if we wanted to do a little math on those long running um, actions, for a 50 minute run running on macOS, we would get charged $4, right? Um, and if we run that two to three times a week, that's around $500 a year. For us, that's cost effective enough for us to not have to manage our own infrastructure to, and put that in a, in a server rack in some office somewhere. And your organization may have a different view on that, right? So this is a way, um, but it's not the only one. Um, but remember, even if you need to do um, private repos in your organization, uh, actions can always be used, tested, uh, or just played with on public repos for no cost. Okay, speaking of that, you can go here, um, fork this repo, and start running some of your, some of the actions that we're gonna go through, um, and take a look at them for yourself. Okay, to do that, if you're unfamiliar, um, go to that link, click the fork button and create a new fork. It'll walk you through it. Once you have that new fork, you can go to your repo, go to the actions, and you'd have to enable them to actually run any of them. You don't need to go ahead, though. It's fine um, if you want to um, go for it. But first of all, we're going to break down kind of what a GitHub action workflow is and break it into each of its parts, um, starting at the workflow itself. I'm gonna pause for a moment because I've been talking a lot. Are there any questions right now? Yes, you're close, there you go. Uh, the, the breakdown of cost showed various levels of two CPUs, eight CPUs, you know, multiple CPUs. How, how much advantage is there to paying more for a, a multiple CPU uh, VM, essentially, I guess. Um, like, how parallel are these workflows? Like, how parallelizable, I guess? Are yeah, they? we'll get into a little bit of that. Did you guys all hear that? Is this on? It's okay in the back? Perfect. Um, I have not tested some of the larger runners. Um, with If you're running it in a public repo, you're gonna only get those baseline ones. So for the private ones, you can, um, if, you ha if your organization has large runners enabled, you can run it as those. Um, it really is just gonna depend on what you're running. So if your script is very CPU intensive, you might want more. Um, but again, might be something that you want somewhere else um, that is maybe potentially cheaper, so. And as we go through, if I don't answer it, we can chat afterwards about it as well. Cool, anything else, cost or anything? Awesome. So, a workflow is a defined set of jobs. It's a YAML file, 
John loves that. Uh, that has to be saved in .github workflows. And here is our first, most basic workflow. Um, we can see that this workflow itself has a name. This is actually optional. Um, if you don't add this in, it will name it uh, the file name, essentially. And we can see this is our repo, the GitHub Actions repo. Um, we can see that this file lives in .github workflows, and again, the name of it here. If we go into our repo on GitHub, go to the Actions tab, we can find our workflow and select it. And then we'll see any runs of this particular workflow. If you forked this and are doing this, you wouldn't see anything because you haven't run it, right? So a yellow right here is meaning that it's currently running in this snapshot. Um, green mean, means it ran successfully, and we don't see it here, but red would mean it failed in some way. So if we click on one of the workflow runs, we would see a summary of what happened on the run. This one had a build job, essentially. Okay, next part of, of our workflow is events, okay? And events are how a workflow gets triggered. So if we go back to that basic workflow, we can see that we have a workflow dispatch trigger created, which will start the workflow when we manually tell it to run on, on GitHub, when we dispatch it to run, okay? So we go back to the actions page in our repo and select our workflow. We can see that we have a run workflow option, and we can use that to run our workflow manually. Okay, so the event is when someone presses this button. And I'll say there are very few workflows that I don't add the workflow dispatch trigger to because there just always seems to be some reason to manually run these. Um, a lot of that can be for testing, but something, sometimes things just happen during a run um, where you want to run it again. And if you're running this on, like on an event push trigger, you don't want to necessarily change your code and push again to run it again. So um, recommendation is just add that in. It will help at some point. Okay. A few other um, hopefully helpful common events. Uh, we can trigger a push on a push to our repo. Um, we can also filter specific branches or branches to ignore if you wanted to do everything but main. Um, you could also add the specific paths or paths to ignore, um, like we see here. Like if I push to my readme, you don't necessarily want to run all my actions on my code, right? Um, or we can have it run on a schedule um, with just a kind of a cron style syntax. Um, and you'll see here the workflow dispatch again. We can add inputs as well to that um, for use in our steps uh, for kind of some variables to run. All right. What that would look like when we go to run our workflow is something like this, where we have the ability to um, type in specific things for our workflow. Okay. Maybe some not so common things, but things that I found when, when I was researching um, that do some cool things. So repository dispatch is an event that gets triggered when a specific webhook is sent to GitHub, okay? So essentially you can trigger them from an outside system. This uh, is somewhat newer, I believe, um, and let's say, you have a program that runs somewhere else, but you want to trigger something to happen on your repo at a certain time, you can send a webhook from that into GitHub Actions to run, and it will tell the, the, your action to run. Does that make sense? So, like for instance, if your MDM can send out a webhook, um, your MDM could do something and then trigger an action in your, um, in your repo to maybe pull something in or do something else. 
And as long as that has uh, the proper token and uh, the, the type as well, um, it will run. And you can put inputs in there. It's pretty interesting. Next one, maybe not so common, is called a workflow call. Um, and this is a way to use reusable workflows. Um, so if you have a lot of repos that you're, you, you are using the same exact workflow on, uh, reusable workflow is a great way for them all to be managed kind of in one location um, by updating one file instead of like all the files on all your repos. Um, we'll go over an example of this a little bit later, um, but initially when we set it up we had a lot of the same workflows and it just took forever for us to update when certain parts of it needed updating. So we've kind of moved it all to using this instead. This last one is kind of just for fun. Um, it will run when the repo is starred. Okay. And this is kind of a, to show you that there are a ton of events um, that you can do. Like pretty much anything that happens in, in GitHub can be used as an event, whether that's an issue that's created or um, lots of different things. Um, and they have lists of them on their documentation that you can go and read. This one is fun. I actually um, set this up on a repo and forgot that I did. And I was giving one of these talks and noticed that my workflow was um, randomly running. I'm like, wait, this is mine. I didn't start that. <laughs> Why is that running? And I figured out afterwards, oh, I actually set that up. I forgot that I did. So anyway, we're at workflow file, and it's triggered by some sort of event going on quickly. Um, a workflow run is made up of one or more jobs, right? Jobs are a set of steps in a workflow that are executed on the same runner. We'll get into runner in a second, but jobs run in parallel by default. We can also run jobs sequentially. Um, so you can have a job kind of depend on a previous job. Back again to our example, we see that we have one job set up. So one runner will be used to run our code. And that runner, again, just like a VM, uh, whether it's Mac OS, um, Linux, Windows, um, the thing that's running our code. Here we can define the name of our job, um, what type of runner we want. Um, we can give it an ID, um, give it a timeout. And a quick note about the name. If you name a job in the step, like you see here, um, it's kind of somewhat limited, can't contain spaces, that sort of thing. However, we can explicitly name it like we do um, up at the top in the workflow. Um, so yeah, actually you can set a timeout. This is how long before GitHub will cancel the run. So that can help us avoid excessive runs which is important if you're in a private repo and you're paying for these, right? So if you have code that gets stuck in a loop or something, you probably want to have a timeout set up so that it just doesn't run forever. And GitHub would probably appreciate it if you're in a public repo too. So things like the name and the ID can be helpful um, visually, even just in, in the workflow itself, looking at it, or when chaining things together, um, or calling outputs of certain steps, or jobs, sorry. So back to the summary page, we can see that our jobs of our workflows are listed on the left, and the overview for them on the right. Um, again, that makes more sense when we look at something like this, a sequential job. This one's part of our Intune workflow. We can see we're building, we're deploying to dev, um, and then we're deploying to prod. If we look at the code for this, the name of that, that second job is deploy to dev, and it needs the build job to finish before it starts running. So that's kind of how we chain those things together. Another example would be a matrix job. It's another strategy we can use to run multiple jobs of the same code at one time. Um, keeps our code dry, so we don't have to repeat a lot of things for each run. 
Um, so one of the downsides of this potentially is that we have to prep our runner each time. This is essentially six different runners. Um, so those steps are all running and can increase kind of that time, um, total time that we're charged for, um, which again can be important depending on your use case. And this is what the code for that would look like. The matrix uh, strategy, and then you have a list of your targets. And then you can actually pull those in as variables later in the code, and we'll see an example later of that too. Um, so side note about the hosted runners, um, and whether or not we need to kind of install our own stuff on them before we run things. Um, so all the specs, pre-installed software, are available on that second link there uh, on the about page. Tell you a lot about um, what they're using, what they have pre-installed, all that sort of thing. And um, I'll say a lot of dev tools are on there. So things like um, AWS or Azure CLI, Xcode on the macOS runners, Java, Python, PHP, et cetera, they're all kind of like pre-installed. So um, you can just start using them. You don't have to run a step to say install Python, um, which is pretty helpful. But if it's not pre-installed, um, you can install more things to it. If you can do that um, with uh, some scripts. And then uh, a note about jobs. Again, this is just worth reminding. Um, I think this might be different than GitLab because it was a sticking point when I was switching from GitLab CI CD to uh, GitHub Actions. Um, each job runs on one runner. Okay, so job's going to set up this runner, uh, which is that VM machine that it's running on. And it has really no knowledge of maybe your second job. So that means if you have some setup for your runner, you're doing some more dependencies, or you're creating some files, it's not going to be necessarily available to that second job um, unless you code that in. And we can show you how to do that. All right, each job that we've been talking about runs one or more steps. Okay, and each step is either a shell script that will be executed or an action that will be run. Okay, so this is getting into that confusing part of GitHub Actions where it's called GitHub Actions, but then there's something else called an action in there. But steps are executed in order and dependent on each other. Since each step is executed on the same runner, like we said, um, you can share data from step to step. For example, if you have a step that builds a package or an application, um, you can follow that with a step to upload that to your MDM. It's a good example, I think, for this crowd. If a step fails, the run will be canceled, so no more of the steps are going to run, um, except for some of the, like, the GitHub run some prereq steps and cleanup steps and things like that. Those are still going to run. And we can actually force certain steps to run if we um, use the always uh, expression in that step. Okay, back to our example. We see our steps here. The one and only one is a shell script that will be run. So for multi-line shell scripts, you can use a pipe on that first line. Um, I think that's a YAML kind of thing. Okay, back to our summary page. Back to the build, we can see all the steps out of run for a job. This one, there's not many, right? There is a couple um, of those ones from that GitHub is going to run to set up their runner and to um, kind of finish it as well. And then we can see our greeting step and expand that and kind of see the output. And it is what we expect. Amazing, right? <laughs> cool. If we select uh, the settings here, we, um, we have a few more options. So we can include showing the timestamps of our commands, um, which gives us a little more verbosity of what happened on that run. Or we can just download the full log of like everything. 
So for this basic example, there's really no need. If you're doing something super complex and multi-steps with maybe potentially multi-runners, logging is, can be very important. All right, back to what we touched on with actions. Um, so an action is a custom application for the GitHub Actions platform that performs a complex or potentially simple but frequently repeated task. So an action can help us reduce the amount of repetitive code um, that we need to write. So it can do stuff like pull in the Git repository or just set up our tools or set up authentication to something. Um, just basically shortcuts, little snippets of code that we can use. So you can write your own actions or you can find actions to use in the GitHub Marketplace. You can even write actions for the GitHub Marketplace. Um, actions themselves can take input from the workflow and they can return output variables as well. All right, so moving past our basic workflow example, here we're looking at an example that builds a package and uploads it to our MDM. We can see that we've added another event for when we push to main, right? When something in our packages example path changes. So it has to be something changing in there. Um, if we look at our steps, we also notice that in some, instead of simply running a command, we are running an action. So the uses keyword specifies that this step will run the v3 or version 3 of the actions checkout action. <laughs> a lot of actions. So the next step is running the Apple actions import code sign cert action. All right. Now instead of just running a version here, we can also run a specific commit hash of that action. So for non-verified actions, I would definitely advise you to always use a commit hash, as a commit hash is going to be more secure since it can't be altered by the original author. Like, I, this could potentially happen. Someone could um, recreate a version or a tag and kind of redo it, uh, inserting some potentially dubious code. Um, and it's not necessarily something we want to run. So, Pinning it to that commit hash uh, prevents that from happening. You'll see this step actually also uses the with keyword to define a couple, couple inputs for the action. So this action itself has a list of things you can use as inputs, and then it'll have some outputs as well. Moving on, um, since we're running a matrix step here of running um, those three jobs, PRD, test, and dev, we can kind of pull those terms in. You can see that in this um, shell script here. And then we're updating some of our code. So we're making it different for those three environments. And then finally, we're using another custom action to build monkey packet, to build a monkey package, or build a package with monkey package, sorry. Um, this is using the main branch of the John Crane monkey package action. So really, I'd rec only recommend you doing that if you kind of own that action, or that's yours, something that you created. Um, and you'll also notice that this step contains an ID. The ID is monkey package, um, which will let us call the output of that action. So as you can imagine, um, that's going to output a package and um, certain things about it, a, a tag, perhaps a version, things like that. So in our next step, we're taking those outputs. Um, we can see the steps dot monkey package. So we're, we have our step, we have the ID of monkey package, we have the outputs and we're taking that file path and then using those as inputs to the GitHub release action. Okay, and finally, can see that we're just uploading uploading that to a to simple MDM here. Um, any questions so far? I know that's kind of chaining a lot together there. Is everybody good? 
Awesome. So actions are discoverable on the GitHub Marketplace. Um, a qu quick Marketplace disclaimer. Anyone can add actions to here. <laughs> it's actually pretty simple. Um, they're not tested. They're not reviewed in any way. Um, so please don't just grab them and say, oh, great, I need that. I'll just start using it. Um, make sure you're doing a proper review of the code um, and test them, obviously, um, before you use them. So here's an example of an extremely common action to check out a GitHub repo. So this one is very common because when we start our job and set up our runner, it doesn't automatically mean that the repo that we started it from is available on that runner. So we usually want to pull it down to do some actions on it. Is everybody following that? Okay. Um, this is also commonly used to check out a repo that is elsewhere. So. I want to pull in another repo um, to, to help with my code. We can also see that this comes from a verified creator. This is from GitHub themselves. Um, we can also see that it is 4, 000, over 4,000 stars. So this one's probably OK. Still probably double check the code. Make sure it's not doing something um, you don't want it to do. If we select the latest version, we can see the code that we can use um, to use in our workflow. Now, Checkout also has a lot of built-in options, um, such as defining a path to um, export, uh, clone it to, um, fetch depth, whether you're pulling in LFS files, things like that. Um, so you can use those options to kind of customize what's getting pulled in. Um, and make things quicker for your use. Um, and you can kind of scroll down that page. I don't have a photo of it to see more of the options. Um, here's another example of potentially useful if you're using AWS. Uh, again, you can see the number of stars, number of contributors. You're still going to want to verify that, right? <laughs> Just because it's popular doesn't mean it's safe for you. Um, we can also see the input variables here at the bottom um, that we may need to use. Some of them are going to be required. Some of them we may want to use um, that are optional. And those would be like that with keyword. So with folder um, blank, whatever your S3 folder is. Oh, I did zoom in it. Awesome. <laughs> Um, we saw this one as well. This is importing certificates. Um, so this one lists a few examples. I think the same ones we were using. But essentially, if we want to see more, um, we would have to look at the code. And the code's not too scary. Um, it's a YAML file again. Um, looks very similar to our workflows. But we can see we have inputs up at the top. We can define, we can use any of those inputs. And then we have outputs at the bottom. And another reminder, um, just because you can use actions, um, you need to ask yourself, should you? Uh, sometimes simple scripts may be better to be added directly to your workflow than instead of potentially adding a complex action that does way more than you actually need it to. It could essentially run longer. So. Depending on what you want to do, it might be easier just to script that. So what if we want to make our own? Um, what all is required? Um, and this is proof that they will let anyone make these things. Um, this is one of mine. Uh, you also have the option to use your own actions, um, even if you don't publish them to the marketplace. It's like two clicks to publish, so um, I did. I don't know if anyone's used it, but that's fine. I still use it um, to do this thing. And again, this is one of those things, like it's only really a few lines of code. Um, if you want to do it yourself, then you don't have to worry about me updating or changing things, that sort of thing. But feel free to use that. Um, this is that action itself. This is just all the code for it. 
again, first we can see our metadata. Um, that's what kind of the marketplace uses to figure out what it is and that icon and that sort of thing. We have our inputs. We can define. You can make them required. Um, you can give it a default value um, and add as many as you want. And you can give it outputs. Okay, if we go down and look at the code itself, the code itself is going to look pretty similar to a step in our job. Say, so, okay, we're running code. Um, you can see where we're pulling in that input, at least one of them. Um, and then you can see where we're setting those output. So there we're setting tag, file name, and file path. So we're exporting those to that GitHub output. So if we look at the output of when this runs, again, we can see the, the input that the user used at the top, and then kind of the code that it's running down there. Okay. So we can set variables in a few different ways for our workflows, um, and there are a lot kind of built in, I would say. Um, so the first example we see is at the workflow level. So we can set it at the workflow level so that the variable is available for all our jobs. Um, or we could set it on the job level so it's available for any of the steps in that particular job. Makes sense. And as you expect, we can set it at the step level. It's off a little bit there. For, uh, to, for it to only be available for that step, essentially. Okay, if we want to define them outside the workflow fly file itself, um, we can go to our repo in GitHub, go to the settings, go to secrets and variables, select actions, and we can see we can set secrets actually, um, which as implied are protected text that cannot be seen on GitHub or in the run after it is set. Um, and then we can use this as an expression in our workflow. So we can bring that in. So we don't have to save passwords in our code. Um, a recommendation that I have after you not using this <laughs> is to use a password manager. Um, this is a, an action from Keeper, but um, I believe one password, Bitwarden, like AWS Secret Manager, a lot of them have similar actions. So this saves a ton of time, um, kind of finding out where you're storing your passwords, what passwords are used on what repos when you want to go and update them. So instead of having multiple secrets defined in GitHub, we can set one secret, so use this keeper. We can set one secret to a token from our uh, secret manager and then access any secrets available to that token. So we can see we're pulling in like a big list of them instead of defining the certificate in the workflow, in the secrets, um, on that secrets page, the API key, all that stuff on the secrets page. We're just defining that KSM config and that allows us to uh, gather those secrets in for our, for our actions. So, recommend to do that, it's a good one. Um, the next option to get variables into your workflow, not in the workflow file, is using the variables in the same location as our secrets. And again, using that vars prefix, we can use those in our workflow. So that could be something um, like you want a specific version, but then when you want to update the version, you don't necessarily need to change the code, you just want to change the variable. Um, it could be something like that, um, or potential other uses. Uh, so we need to st still set these um, values from those secrets and variables to environmental variables at some level. And the example here, we can see at the step level. So we're setting that uh, token, that website, um, 
at the step. So then our script has those um, variables available to it. So as the Python script, it's going to pull in those variables um, for us to use. And then when it runs, if we look at the job after it runs, look at those steps, we can see it's not going to show um, any of the secrets that we've defined, but the variables it will show. Now, you could potentially um, print out one of those, so just be careful with your code. It's not going to um, mask that anywhere it's found. Um, so definitely be careful when handling those in your, in your scripts itself. So GitHub also has a couple of special variables that can be set um, and, and give you more logging on the run. Uh, and you can set these as variables or secrets, doesn't matter. The runner debug log will output two or more logs. Oh, sorry, two more logs. The runner and worker process logs. And the step debugger increases the verbosity of a job's log during and after a job's execution. So you're just going to get more text when you read those steps. And then when you download the log itself, you're going to see more verbosity for that. Cool. Any questions on those variables before we move on? Cool. Awesome. All right. Talking about cache. So you're going to use caching when you, you want to reuse files that don't change often between jobs or workflow runs. Um, things like build dependencies, um, that sort of thing. And you kind of use it to speed up your runs. If you're building Python, let's say, um, just for a certain thing, like you want to build Mac and Min's Python, use it in a script. Um, you might want to store that as cache so that it's available on the next run and doesn't take five minutes to build. So that's kind of the idea. Here is a terrible example of caching monkey code. <laughs> I say it's terrible. It's, not, it's fine. It works. Um, it's not going to save a whole lot of time because it's not a lot of code. But um, it is showing you how to use it. So we have the actions cache action. Um, which will return any cache data to the monkey path, which we see. Um, and it's looking for any cache hit that is, is found with this key. So we have a monkey commit in this uh, workflow. We have the runner it's on, so it's going to say like Linux, monkey code, and then that monkey commit. If we update that monkey commit, it's going to see that that cache is going to be different, so it's going to redo it. And then finally, in our next step, we're using an if statement, which can be pretty handy. This is also where you would put like that always that we talked about, if you want the step to always run, if always. But in this case, we're saying if the monkey code cache um, step has an output of cache hit, then skip the step, essentially. And we can see that here. It's found the cache. It skips the checkout and then kind of does the, the post cache stuff at the end to, to check to see if it's changed at all. We can actually look at those caches to see the names of it. Um, and that first one there has that uh, runner OS, has that, that monkey commit that we're using. So when the next action runs, if it finds this, it will use it. It will bring that code in instead of going out um, and downloading it again or creating it again. Can be a little confusing. Is that that good? Any questions there? Perfect. Awesome. So artifacts are pretty similar to cache, but different in pretty important ways. Um, they allow you to share data between jobs um, or store data 
once that workflow has completed. And you're like, well, cache does that too, kind of. Um, cache, you can't really download after the fact. Artifacts, you can. Um, some of the common artifacts that you, you can potentially upload that people do would be like log files, um, test results, failures, screenshots even, um, outputs of, of builds, things like that. And we'll go through a quick example here. Another, like, this really doesn't do anything example, but um, we can see we have job one. It's uh, creating a text file and then uploading it with the uploads artifacts action. So step one, ran, grabbed this file, uploaded it as an artifact, and that artifact is available on our repo, okay? Job two then runs. It's gonna download that artifact. So that pulls it in. It's running on a different runner. This is running on Windows instead of Linux. Now that has that file available to it. It's gonna do some more actions on it um, and then upload it again because we want to use our macOS runner now. So the macOS runner runs. Again, needs job two, so it's waiting for that. Looks for that artifact. Um, if it finds it, downloads it, and then prints out the final result. So this is what the job summary would look like for that again. Um, we can see kind of the flow of the workflow. And then if we look at the results of that final step, we see the final result. So artifacts, um, you do have some options in GitHub. If we go to settings, actions, uh, general page, um, we also have a few other settings for some of the permissions of the actions, but then we also have these artifact retention um, uh, variables that we can set. So those don't last forever. So if you create an artifact and then four months later you wanna take a look at what that was, you might be out of luck depending on what that is set to. Can be set at the org level as well um, if your organization is, is managing that as well. All right, so I think we're, I think hopefully that's uh, given you kind of a baseline of what you can potentially do. Um, with GitHub Actions. We're gonna show you some maybe potential actions for Mac-related tasks that we use. Um, and the first one is code verification and linting. So if you want to run some linting on your code, let's say you have people committing and you wanna make sure that it's in a proper format um, and verified, you can run processes, and there's a lot out there uh, built in to make sure that it is in a, uh, the proper um, code style that you want to use. So, can't remember if I mentioned this earlier, but we do use pre-commit. Um, it is kind of something that you can uh, set on the repo to run a bunch of steps and make sure that it does that linting, it does that the format checking. You can do lots of different things. Um, if you want to know more about it, um, Elliot Jordan in the back there gave a talk a few years um, ago at, at Mac and Min's on that. I'd encourage you to go check that out. Um, and let's see, this job we're running here is an example of a, a reusable workflow, right? And this is a good, um, Good example of that because we're gonna have this on all our repos because we want this to run for everything. So we can see that we're ignoring the main branch actually because um, we wanna run this before we merge this commit to main. So it does us no good to run it on the main branch. So whenever something's uh, pushed to a feature branch, we're gonna run this and if it fails, that author knows they need to fix something in their code. So um, a look at the jobs themselves. This is a little bit different. Um, instead of defining a step, it actually just defines another workflow to go in and pull and run. If we look at that other file, 
So uh, the one we just looked at was in all our repos. This one is in one central repo that we can um, update itself. We can see that the event trigger is again that workflow call. And we can see that we're using this pre-commit action to actually grab that pre-commit file in our repo and run it and test it. Cool. Um, next example, building packages. Well, we kind of already went through this, but I'll show you a couple more things here um, and, and why this is interesting. So this, is, again, is an example of building a package. Um, we're inputting the details of our signing certificate. Um, this is good if your whole team maybe doesn't have access to this certificate or these secrets, okay? Um, you can add these to those secrets. If you're an admin, you can see them, um, not see them once they're in there, but um, be able to edit them, update them. So I believe the Mac admins open source um, uses this to be able to sign packages for people without giving them the actual signing cert. Um, but we can see that here. And we can see again, we're just running that package. Um, another example, this is from that organization. Um, I think Nate uh, did this action. Um, this one's actually signing and notarizing uh, Monkey. So he has those, those secrets stored um, and then his actions able to pull those in. Um, so you can manage those at the admin level and all the repos inside that org can kind of have that benefit of having that available. Yes. Um, and then as implied earlier, we do run auto package on GitHub Actions. Um, and I have an example repo set up on GitHub um, that is pretty similar to our production repo actually. Um, it's at another repo. I, I call it auto monkey because I like making stupid names for things apparently. Um, because this is actually a monkey repo and it essentially automatically updates itself. Um, we're not storing the packages in this one because this is just a test repo essentially. But this is what it looks like so we can kind of see it's kind of like a monkey repo. It doesn't have that packages, doesn't have catalogs because usually you would build that in your, um, if you're pushing to a cloud or something. Um, so yeah, it's trivial to drop those into AWS S3, another cl cloud bucket um, as part of that run. Um, if we look at that auto package source folder, we can kind of see um, auto package tools show up again. Uh, Nick McSpadden created that many, many years ago, um, and it has been forked and then forked again and then forked again. And it kept the name for some reason. I don't think there's any code left of his left in this one in particular. Um, but uh, if you're familiar with the Gusto um, company, they've, they've, they are, have forked this a number of years ago and have talked about it running in on GitHub Actions as well. Um, but you can kind of see those files here, and we have our overrides directory for auto package um, uh, as well. So what this looks like in, in GitHub, if we go to the repo itself, we check on that workflow, we can see our jobs, and they're running. It's not much to look at, is it? Um, but if we see all the steps, these are the steps that, that we have in ours for, so installing Monkey, installing package, essentially getting that macOS runner to be um, our auto package machine. So we run the make catalogs, do that setup for Python, um, and then run that auto package tool script. And that has most of the code in it that's gonna do what we need it to do. Um, has also options for webhooks to Slack, um, so we know when things notif when, when things update, or if they fail, if a step fails, it'll show us. 
Um, also gives us a summary. We put this in a public Slack channel, so those in our testing catalog can see kind of what's been updated if they're interested. I don't think anyone is, <laughs> but it's there for them if they need it. Um, and another cool thing that we have is kind of these automatic creation of uh, PRs for updates to trust info for auto package. I'm also kind of assuming that everyone has a basic understanding of auto package and that's probably a bad assumption. So if you're, if you don't, um, I, I'm sorry, I'm not, we definitely don't have time to get into all the nuances of auto package, but um, we, we know if we're running a recipe and the author changes it, essentially, we have to update our file to match that change so, we, so that we know we've seen that code, it's good, we still want to run it, so we have to do that. So this creates that PR automatically for us. Um, it's running verify um, with three Vs. This is three. I, you can, I think you can do it with two as well. Just did an extra one just to be safe. You know? <laughs> um, but this will show us actually what changed in the upstream code because the file that updates is only updating a, a, a hash. Um, but we can see this one, they changed the, the pattern for the regex. We can say, oh, that's good, merge. Um, some of these we're obviously going to want to test. We pull that down and, and do more. But um, this is very helpful, makes that very quick, especially if it's just um, a quick change from, from an author for who knows what, but um, pretty helpful. Um, I, have Q&A here. If we don't have a lot of questions, I can um, go and show you some runs. Um, but again, <laughs> there's not much to, to show per se, um, but I can do that if someone would like, um, including the, that auto package run um, since we do have 13 minutes. But uh, for right now, let's start with questions. Does anybody have? Any questions? Way in the back, oh my gosh. I think I can throw this that far? I don't know, here. I'll run it back. So you mentioned verified actions, uh, and, and you can see on the right sidebar whether it's verified or not. What does that mean? Does, do people have to like, get a blue check mark from GitHub, or what, what, what does it take to get a <laughs> verified status? I think that's verified creator. Um, so that's some company that is kind of backing that action. So that in that case, it was GitHub. I think Microsoft, um, potentially Amazon may have some as well. I, I'm not 100% sure on who all gets that and how, but it is something that they do have available. So. And do, you, do you know like how a, a random person at another company would get that, or is it is it just like invite only from GitHub? I don't know. Okay, sorry, but cool. Maybe I can learn and follow up. Yeah, yeah, definitely try. Someone try to become a verified creator, and we'll see. Huh? Another question, Nate. Thank you. So one of the things I struggle with, with actions, workflows, whatever we want to call them, um, <laughs> do you prefer to write, like, I saw some bash scripts in some of your examples. Do you prefer to write them into, like, the action code or write a bash script separately and just call the bash script or Z shell script or whatever? Like, what, what's your opinion, I guess? There are many ways to do this, <laughs> right? <laughs> Um, it de I think it depends on where you want the complexity. Um, if you if you want it, you know, in your main repo in that source, um, because yeah, anything could be. You just have a really long action. Um, I tend to. There's a point like even our our auto package script. There's definitely some consolidation that could happen as far as like setting up. Um, auto package itself, um, like 
it's getting to be more than 10 lines. Usually I'm thinking, yeah, probably is better to put that in a script just so it's more readable. Um, but it's really up to the author themselves. I mean, you can go a step further and be like, well, I'm just going to put all of this in an action. And I did that. I, I created a Mac OS, install Mac OS package action, which is like two steps. But I thought, well, I want this to be one. So <laughs> So yeah, I created that, which abstracts it even more. But it just essentially puts the code somewhere else. So yeah, I mean, it really depends on where you want things um, and what's easier for you to, to update, I guess. I mean, they're both going to be fairly easy. But um, yeah, that, it, it doesn't really answer your question. But well, it, it is definitely an opinion thing. And as yeah. you said, there's more than one way to do it kind of thing. So I just didn't know what your uh, philosophy is on it, I guess. Yeah, I don't have a hard and fast rule. Um, if you look at some of my stuff, some of it's going to be one way, and some of it's going to be others. And there's no rhyme or reason necessarily. Um, but yeah, like I said, if it's just if it's getting too long, I'll probably condense and consolidate just to make the that workflow to be more readable. All right, anyone else? Is anyone interested in like me walking through them through some some of these on on GitHub? You're like, I got this. Anybody? OK. Yeah, that sounds great. Let's do it. Let's do it. Um, <laughs> so this is that um, repo we were just looking at um, again. We can come into the actions menu, and we can see this build. I'm going to go ahead and start this, and we can go look at some other ones. Let's say we wanted to run Google Chrome dot monkey. So we just want to run one recipe instead of like our whole list. We can do that. We can see the workflow run successfully requested. If we refresh the page. We can see that it's running. We can click into it. We can actually click into the job. Kind of see that as it's running. Um, depending on how busy, I would say, um, actions are, sometimes this won't update for a bit. It will take a while. And then it will kind of spit out more of the logs kind of thing. We're going to come back to that one in a second, because that's going to run. But again, um, this is that demo repo. Um, if we wanted to run that package build folder, we can run that. Again, it ran. We can see that this one's going. This one's doing those three jobs, um, because that's in that matrix. Um, we can see them all. If we wanted to click into one of those, we can see what it's doing. This one has that debug um, step uh, on it, so it's giving us more verbosity for these. Um, and that one's already complete. So I had some of these things um, commented out, so that's why that's not running. But we can see somewhere down here. So I up uploaded that release to the releases page on this uh, repo. So that would be here. Since these are the same thing, it's not creating a new release, but it did update these packages here. Um, if we go back over to this one, it is actually running. So this is that setup job that uh, GitHub does, um, checking out the repo, installing Monkey. This uses that uh, macOS package install. So I just gave it an URL, and it's going to download and, and install that. You can see it doing that. Same thing with install auto package. We can look in each of these steps, kind of get more information about what happened um, on each one. Now it's running auto package. It's doing that, that verification of that recipe um, and then actually running it. 
Now you can really do a lot of things here. Um, this one's checking the CPU percentage because on some of these runs it was just like stopping and I'm like, well, is it CPU bound um, or not? But that's essentially just in my script. So anything you can script, you can kind of feed back into your logs. So that's what that's doing. Um, something I, I didn't mention is that GitHub also has a ton of variables available, um, including like GitHub token, the ID of the run, um, the ID of the run, like a lot of stuff related to the repo that you're in or the action that you're running and things like that. This one looks like it finished up. I'm pretty sure since I ran this late last night, um, there's not a new uh, Chrome available, so it, it didn't download anything, but it did finish. Um, and if we look at like the time, it ran for three minutes and 17 seconds um, to run that one recipe. However, um, a lot of that was in the setup of the job only a minute and 24 was actually like running. So um, pretty quick. Does that bring up any more questions from anyone or anything else that you'd, you'd wanna see? Cool. Um, again, like fork that one as well, um, try it out if you want to uh, get more into auto package or, or even monkey if you haven't had any familiarity with that or if you just want to try it. Um, feedback is available at this link. Um, appreciate your feedback if you have it. Um, thank you once again for coming. I do appreciate it. I know you have lots of options today, so thank you for coming here and joining us.